we're going to uh, start the uh, humanities program here at the Stavig House. Thanks for joining us tonight at the Stavig House Museum in Sisseton. I'm John Rasmussen and I'm president of the museum. And we're happy that you could be with us to celebrate this 25th anniversary of the Stavig House by being part of this virtual program in conjunction with the School of Architecture at, the, at South Dakota State University and at the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg. This is the first ever, ever virtual program from the Stabbing House Museum, and it's sponsored by funds from South Dakota Humanities Council, and we thank the South Dakota Humanities Council for their support. The house that I'm sitting in right now was built by Andrew and Mary Stabbing for their growing family. The construction began in 1915 and was completed in 1916. The house is on the National Registry of uh, Historic Places in, in the United States. A little background for you. Andrew Stavig was six years old when his family immigrated from Norway to America in 1876. The family made their way to Dakota Territory and they homesteaded uh, just south of Fort Sisseton. Andrew was the oldest and he would become uh, the, the uh, uh, um, the oldest member in a family of seven children uh, to, born to Lars and Mar and Stavi. He learned English and he developed an entrepreneurial spirit and he went into partnership in a retail business in the newly developing town of Sisseton, South Dakota. He had previously before that, um, his father wrote to his brother that Andrew was, had become a peddler and was uh, driving um, uh, goods around to other homesteaders and selling out of the back of a wagon as a peddler does. But in 1900, he bought out his partner in Sisseton. He moved to Sisseton and bought out his partner in a store and brought his two brothers into the retail business in what would become the Stabbing Brothers Incorporated. And it would serve the Sisseton area for uh, nearly a century. As an entrepreneur and a businessman, Andrew was interested in the latest trends, whether it be uh, merchandise in the store, and the store carried every imaginable good there could be found, or if it was building a substantial home that has been a landmark here in Sisseton for 105 years. The Stabbing House is a Queen Anne style house with a three-storied corner turret that's unique and it has a unique craftsman style interior. The house is uh, authentic and very little uh, has changed uh, over the past century with the structure of the house or the interior. It's not surprising that the electrical and mechanical systems that are in the house were advanced for 1915. Um, this attests to Andrew's interest and in following the, the latest developments. I kind of think he would be delighted to know that this new technology offers a, us a virtual opportunity to look through the walls of the house with laser scans that provide this program and to, to provide this program virtually. Uh, his father, Andrew's father in 1926 wrote to his brother about how interesting it was that these new things like radio were coming through the air from as far away as Germany. That was 95 years ago. I wonder what he'd think if he could be part of a virtual program where you could sit in the house and, and be broadcasting uh, across uh, uh, the internet. Along with the forward thinking uh, Andrew, he was also a keeper of things. He kept records uh, on the store and records in the house. And we found those uh, very helpful when, when we were uh, doing this project to help understand the connections in the house. The, 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 the details from the building list, for instance, uh, the, the list of uh, building materials from O.T. Oxnes Company out of Sisseton, South Dakota, the price for all the materials was $1,943.50. Now, if you push that forward to today's uh, and, you, and you account for inflation, in, in, in today's numbers, it would be worth $52,192 for the material list. And that included things like 3,200 brick at $16 a thousand, uh, 8,500 feet of well-seasoned number three Idaho white pine flooring, six inch width. It 
it included things like 43,000 extra clear red cedar shingles, number one shingles, or another listing of 38,500 feet, 38,500 feet of number one white pine lath, four feet wide, wide. And if you took those four foot lath, and if you stack, put them end to end, you'd have over seven miles of lath that's on the walls in the house awesome. and in the ceiling. Oh, is that right? Yeah. That would be that would be part of the construction of the lath and plaster. Over that lath, they put on 27,000 pounds of flint plaster, which equals 13.5 tons of plaster that was hand troweled on the walls of the house. So you learn a lot of things when you go back through old records. And it's pretty amazing that all of these things were saved as part of the house. We also learned through oral interviews in the, it, it, that Art Rice, Art Rice was an immigrant from Norway and he was a shipbuilder that came and worked on the home. And he had his son Hillman Rice and other builders that worked with him. The shipbuilding skills of Art Rice are evident in the layout of the compound miters on the oak flooring in the dining room of the Stabbing House. The building skills of the Rice families is legendary in Sisseton. Arndt's son, Hillman Rice, restored Fort Sisseton in the 1930s as a WPA project. He spent two years working on that project. He also built St. Peter, Peter's Catholic Church and Grace Lutheran Church in the 1950s, and he built many family homes in the area. In our 25th anniversary year at the Stabbing House, we received a grant with funds from the South Dakota Humanities Council to work with the School of Architecture at South Dakota State University to look deeper into the con construction techniques of this home that was started in 1915 and completed in 1916. Uh, this summer, a team from SDSU came to the Stabbing House with their laser equipment and several members of the School of Architecture Brian Rex uh, is our presenter tonight, and he was part of this investigative architectural team uh, that came this summer to the Stavig House in Siston. Brian is currently uh, serving as associate professor and head of the Department of Architecture at the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg, Canada. Happy that you're tonight. Tell us about your findings on this project at the Stabbing House. Brian Thank you very Rick. much, John. If, if uh, when you all, when you and you and Jane contacted me originally about this uh, this opportunity, if you'd have told me that I would have been uh, sitting in a basement in Winnipeg presenting the work at that time, I would have I would have thought you absolutely crazy. But I I, I am a, I am up here, uh, and things are going well. We don't have a laser scanner here. So uh, I'm hoping that we can get one. But um, when the when the Stavik House contacted us uh, about this opportunity through the South Dakota Humanities Council um, to do a study of this house, uh, we have a technology at SCSU that we're, we seem to be one of the only schools around that has it. And it's something that's just starting to, to arrive. Before I get going, though, I would like to point out that we acknowledge and respect the ancestral treaty lands on the Lake Traverse Reservation in South Dakota, home of the Sisseton, Wapaton, Dakota, the Achete Sakawin, the Great Sioux Nation, where this project has been undertaken. SDSU, because the team that worked on this comes out of SDSU, I think we should, we should acknowledge this as well, that they, we acknowledge the land it occupies across South Dakota as the ancestral, traditional, and contemporary lands of the Achete Sakawin, meaning seven council fires which is the proper name for the people referred to as Sioux. We acknowledge that before these sites were named South Dakota State University, they were called home by people of American Indian nations indigenous to this region. And finally, because of where I'm at now, I feel um, responsible that I would, I want to acknowledge that the University of Manitoba campuses are located on the original lands of Ashpenag, Cree, Oji Cree, Dakota, and Dene peoples, and on the homeland of the Métis Nation. We respect the treaties that remain on these territories. We acknowledge the harms and mistakes of the past, and we, de we dedicate ourselves to move forward in partnership with indigenous communities in a spirit of reconciliation and collaboration. And I think that, uh, you know, that we, there's more to this project. Sisseton interested me before I ever heard of 
uh, particularly at the Stalin Museum, although when I came to Sisseton, it was one of the first that I saw. Um, because Sisseton is what I would consider a federal town. I'm very interested in overall in the, the urban structure of a lot of the towns in South Dakota. Um, Sisseton is fairly unique. I believe it's a half mile by one mile uh, grid um, laid out from, from Washington, D.C. But that's some other research and we'll get to that uh, someday. Um, I want to acknowledge too, again, John, Jane and John for uh, giving us this opportunity as well as the, the folks at the South Dakota Humanities Council. Um, my students and I have eaten some great lunches and dinners uh, in Sisseton and we uh, have been kind of crawling around on the, on, the, on the old tank over by the restaurant and uh, uh, we, we appreciate that Sisseton has let us look around and point at things and take photos and kind of pick and pull at the town. And I hope we can do more. We, we, we really want to um, study systems more. I also want to acknowledge the Department of Architecture at SD State really made this happen. Um, and without the, the equipment that SDSU has to be able to do this, we wouldn't normally be able to do this kind of thing. Um, one more acknowledgement set is the team that they did this. Uh, Mr. Spencer Yepesen, who I believe is here now, uh, who is a uh, second year undergraduate student in the Department of Architecture in the professional program. Um, he, he did so much on this and he uncovered and, and bowled through a lot of amazing things that we did um, to, get, to get them there, to get it managed, to get it figured out. And he deserves a lot of credit for this project. Katie Eichel uh, sat at the museum uh, did a lot of record keeping, studied the historical record and did back, background stuff. And then Anna, Andrew and Garrett all did scanning uh, on site for us and crawled in some hot attics, got some insulation on them. Uh, various kinds of things that you get when you go see such beautiful buildings as this. So the, the, the team has done an amazing job and now let me show you some of the things about it. So as John, I asked John to give that uh, uh, quick history of, of the museum because uh, the, he can do it. They, they can do it much better than I can. But so we have this artifact. We have this thing sitting in Sisseton, South Dakota. There, there's this building. Um, by the way, that's in the tan cap there, that's Spencer. Uh, I think the, the other guy is me and then that's Anna. But you have this beautiful house. It's uh, got kind of a, a near twin up the hill. It sits uh, uphill from the downtown, I believe in the southwestern quad of the city. And uh, it's got an amazing footprint to it. It's got an amazing presence. It's been preserved to this point. And we were asked to try to, try to go into this thing and figure out, find some things about it, um, try to reinforce some of these notions and, and histories that, that exist of it, like of the, of the Norwegian shipbuilders working on it. And, um, and, and also the, the other one that we really keyed on was, can we find traces and evidences of the kind of technologies that the, the family was integrating into the house in the original construction of it and then subsequently um, a lot of this stuff is buried. A lot of this stuff is not on the surface. This is a Queen Anne house, properly done. It doesn't have a, a, a modern twinge to it. It doesn't do that kind of thing. It doesn't wear its technologies, uh, you know, as a uh, on its sleeve. But here, you know, here here we have the house. Um, the way this technology works is, I don't know if you all can see the. The quality of these images, but this is a this is a pair of scans on the exterior of the house. Um, the one image I forgot today is the image of what the scanner looks like. It sits on a tripod, like a surveyor's tripod, and um, it's just a, a box, and it spins and rotates a full three sixty uh, twice while a mirror inside of it spins like this and shoots laser, uh, laser pulses out into space. And when they bounce back and come back to it, it reads them as these points. And what we are looking at here is nothing but points. There's no lines, there's no surfaces. There's... What? Oh. So, no. 
my wife just came and told me we're not sharing the screen. I can't hear anybody. Uh, how do I share the screen? Oh, there we go. I'm sorry. Fortunately, somebody in the house is watching this the, the stop. <laughs> well, now I hear you all. Uh, I'm sorry. I was just talking away. Could you see me? I ho hopefully. So sorry about that. I got I got all I got all going there. Brian, um, we could see you just fine. We just couldn't see the image on the of the house. Okay. Well, there was a beautiful image of the house, just a photograph as I was talking over it there. But then we I went to this this which is a scan of it. And the interesting thing about this, it's a very it's a very data rich, complicated uh, technology that's still being worked out. Our, our new, the new Apple iPhones and the, in the latest uh, versions now have an ability to do a crude version of this. This is a very, very exact system. Um, but what's interesting about this from, from the end of the school and when why we're really interested in this is everything else in architecture has pretty much been digitized except for the recording of where we where we're working at. Um, there are there are digital representations of that through GIS and things like that, which is something I'm also interested in, in studying. But there really isn't a way to pull directly what's there over on over into the computer and then work in it, work on the thing that's there or a direct copy of it until this is starting to happen. It's still been clipboard paper. Um, measuring tape and pencil and usually takes two people and we've measured it up and then drawn it up from the measuring of it but this technology is coming very quickly at us other industries are using it we had a wonderful student who uh, worked uh, as an intern at Tesla in Reno Nevada and at Tesla they have robot dogs that have this technology on them then walk through construction sites and, and, and record this in this manner, all these things like this. Um, so this is something that's really, really emerging and we wanna be part of it. it. It helps us to do this kind of forensic study. Um, so this is what one scan would look like. It's taken from that ball right there. And the, uh, you can see that it kind of lights it like almost like it's a, it's a spotlight or a, a point light, I should say, not a spotlight. Um, and that's what one scan does. And then what we do is we amalgamate or, or congregate those scans together, or scans all through the building into one big model. So here you can see, oh yeah, this is, and this is when you zoom in on it, sorry. When you zoom in on it, that's all you see is there's just dots in there. So it's, it's truly back to uh, the ideas of Monet and the Impressionists. The images you see are totally pointillist. It, it's like Pissarro, like bow, 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 and it's all you're seeing. The way the technology operates that way is that it shoots those laser pulses out into space, collects them all back, and then runs a camera across the space in the, in the second pass, and then maps the color that it sees at that point where that point was taken with the laser onto that laser point. So that's how you're getting the color in this. It's a super complicated thing. The file for the house is over it's, I think it ended at 82 gig. Um, it's not the most complicated scan we've done. We've done downtown Brookings from the depot all the way over to 6th and Main at Wells Fargo. Uh, we've scanned other smaller houses like the, uh, oh gosh, I can't remember the name of the house now. It's the, oh, the Volstorf house in Brookings. Um, but this house, we've never scanned anything that, that gave us such a hard time as this house has. And I think there's reasons why, and, and it's good. It's not, a, it, we're not, we're not frustrated by it. We understand why it's doing it, but this is a, the scan now is about 160 scans total. So you can see here, this is made up of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven scans at this point. Ryan, so are, the, are the little, are the little orbs there? Are they the location of the scanner where the scanner was placed? Those little round circles? Exactly. You're right. So we're so we're moving the scanner up high, as you can see with this one. I, I can't get a pointer here, but you can see the high, what, the high one there. And so the closer the scan is to the building, the more the building will be lit up like a light, right? Because the more points will hit it because it's closer to the scanner. So and it doesn't throw as far. So there's more there. So you can see at the back door there where the screen door is open. If you look straight up on the soffit, 
up on the second floor, the scanner is hit that above there really intensively up there. And that was the picture aggregate. that was that was the picture that was in the system courier on the front page. You oh. and the scanner, I mean, on the tripod right there in that back door going down into the basement. So that that's a reference. Yeah, I totally forgot the picture, but the, 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 but this is what this is this is the really great thing that Spencer put together that really explains it well. So imagine there's a uh, we're, we're going to pull a scan at A and a scan at B. So at A, what we what we got to do is we've got to find common points in X, Y, X, Z, and, and Y, Z. So you have to be able to look at it and see that those points are there in red, green, uh, red, blue, and yellow. And then know that you can still see those same points in the other scan so that the same surfaces are all registered together and prep for that. You can see the scanner there is the little yellow guy there in the, in the, in the image there. But then that what that does is each each scan results in that many files. Oh, you can see on the on the right the, on the right side that that each of those lit up as a scan, and then that's all the files that go with it. And so one of the difficult things still about this is you really can't move it. The computer that it's on that it comes into has to be the computer that runs it, and that that's what we've learned with this house uh, the hard way. These are huge, huge files, and they're very, they're a complicated inner, inner working set of, of smaller files that I can't tell you what they even mean, and I don't really want to know. I just know that I have to leave them alone and be nice to them. Um, so when, once we get the scanner together, the really hard part and the really fun part, and where we really begin to do a lot of uh, study on this, is we begin to take, the, so this is the photograph on the left of, of one scan. And this is the photograph on the right of another scan. And these are 360 views that you can move around in. And then you have to find your common points in those two scans and pick on them, just like we did with those uh, yellow, red, and blue uh, points that Spencer set up. So you would uh, pick on the, the boards between the, I believe this is the coal cellar, right, John? Right, yeah. Um, so this, this wooden wall would, would have separated the coal bin in the back. So on the face of that coal bin, you can pick up on the wood and the one scan and the other scan. Then you probably picked up on that door that's leaning on the side there or else the green drum. And you just link them together. So it's a fairly tedious process. Um, and it's pretty, it, but it's really fun because you really get to know what's in, what's in the space. Um, and then it produces these things like this. So this is a set of three scans, one going, uh, oh, one, two, three, four scans probably. Uh, showing that really reveals what the inner structure of how that back stair system works. The back stairs are, uh, yeah, I'm gonna come to those. They're very interesting back there. Or this is the uh, the butler's pantry kitchen sort of service end of the house sequence going out to the, the, the side sun porch. And so you begin to start to see the, these rooms start to appear in this and, and the relationship between them and how walls line up and where cavities exist and you know, when something is shy as something else, then you start to realize that there's probably something back there behind it. And so we begin to pick through this thing and look through it. Um, this Here's another example of a scan lineup where in the interior, we do a scan at A and B. So that's the view A. And this this spot behind the fireplace, as you're gonna see in a minute, is one of the, one of the most interesting parts of the house, I think. Uh, and then the view B. And it has these beautiful frames, and you you pick at this, and the next thing you know, you're uh, you're trying to uh, pick pin those two together. You can see the fireplace over there in the right, and uh, trying to equate so that you know that on the in the left image on the far left up above the door is that white flat, and that's in the right center or left you know, the center of the image on the top up there. And you begin to pick these things through. You can see Spencer's feet in there. It'll scan us and we'll, uh, we'll, we can take ourselves out. I even suggested that one scan we ought to do is to take out the, the house and just leave the, uh, the antiques and all left. Like this is the suite and the, so this is the formal suite in the front of the house at the entry. Um, you can see the foyer, uh, the kind of vestibule or it's, all, it's almost an ingle nook, but it's not quite an ingle nook. Then the dining and the, the parlor and the formal living room are off to the side with the porch on the front. But this is what was happening to us. And if you can, if you look at that close, what's happened is the whole interior of the house, especially the attic, has slid forward out over the street. <laughs> and it would just, it would just do this randomly to us. So the, 
the pores, it's like a, it's like a cicada and the, it's left its, um, it's left its shell back there and it's sort of moved forward and there was no way of undoing these. So we just had to start from scratch again and go back at them with no, knowing that we were going to run through it again. Uh, this, this was a particularly good one, but the, but the turnout and the outcomes and the things you start to see and the relationships you start to be able to build out of it are well worth this. Um, they're going to make this process easier. And the, and the students that learn this process and work through this with me in the kind of forensic way you can build this through this, because this is the same technology. If there were a murder, you know, God forbid, um, this is this technology would be brought in and they would scan the crime scene before anybody touched anything. So they would have this really, really exact record of that scene before they begin to move any condition of it. Um, so it's used in all kinds of technology, uh, issues like crime, but, um, you know, moving forward, the other thing you can do, so you, you've got the scan of it, and then you can also take slices through the scan, and you can see when I turn the background white, you begin to see uh, where, the, where the voids are in the house and where the voids are continuous and where they're not. Um, one of the things that fascinates us and the thing that gave us the most trouble is the attic. And if you look at the very top of this image, you can see we're catching the very top of the chimney way up there. So you can see the basement, first floor, second floor, and third floor or, or attic. And then all the way up there is where the top of the chimney is. Um, there's, a, there's a really beautiful, uh, almost cathedral-like space up there in that very top attic because it's all clear, uh, clear lumber, um, really nice big uh, pieces with no interior uh, bracing or anything up there. But the scans up there are what gave us the most fits. But you can see the basement floor is uh, the basement floor, and you know, there, it, like any basement floor. But and there's another scanner over in the far left, like a Where's Waldo? Uh, let's see. Come on, go forward. There we go. So we can we can cut it like that on the side on the side, or we can begin to open it up and look at the functional layouts of the place, and then and then again still see more of these cavities. Because the cavity is right in there, the cavity that runs continuously through the house that we really want to focus on, it runs there through the behind the fireplace, all the way from the ba from the basement floor, all the way to the top of that chimney, and then there's things around it that we're starting to find. Um, but there's still some still some real puzzlements that we're still trying to figure out. But you can see the layout of the house. Um, is pretty well defined out of that. It's it's what we call enfilade rather than, uh, it, it doesn't really have a lot of hallways. It has this one in the center there where the black plane is. Uh, there's one kind of closet under the stairs, a bit of, bit of hallway, but other than that, that's the only hallway in the whole house. So I can make this, there we go. And you begin to see and what, what, what's on one floor and how it relates to what's on the floor above it and how they stack this thing. There's, there's a key part issue about that stacking. Oh, here's another thing too. You can, you can slice through just a thin slice of the, of the house. And again, this is where I, um, you can see that the chimney is sliced through and the chimney is present way at the very top, the very top of the chimney. And then down at the ba in the basement, there's also that, that thing there. We're beginning to start to find that uh, that, that, that vertical space through there while we're looking for other vertical spaces too, because we know that there's other, other sensibilities, that there's some hidden technologies in here. And, uh, you know, what, even when we find them, well, can we, can we identify what they are? Um, we were able to take slices and sections through the house to just to bring it down. So we can see here, there's a bearing wall that, that goes through because all the walls from, from bottom to top line up on top of it or else they have a beam and a column and, uh, 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 carrying and distributing the, the weight of the load. Um, and, you know, when you got you, so you're given this kind of, it's not raw data, but it, and it's because it's, 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 it's been refined through these combinations and all this kind of thing. But when we're trying to figure out how to see through the walls and see, see what the house is and start to see relationships in it, there's some, there's two artists that I that I, I find I, I use I find is resonant for the for the students and myself. The um the one is Dolosa, who, who uh, this is actually working in silk, uh, to make something that's really similar to what we're doing, and, and a, a very resonant kind of space where those it's very ephemeral, it's very light, 
the the, the system of construction of the silk is is there in there, it, just like the the system of construction of the scans are in there. But there's a there's an ability to change you know what's lit up, what has to be touched, what doesn't have to be touched, the relationships of the parts between it. The other artist is Rachel White Reed, who's been around for a while. This is actually the casting of the space between and behind the books and the bookshelf. Um, she moved her work, she's moved her work sort of since then to be things like this, where she's uh, cast whole buildings and then cast the stairways um, in buildings and then pulled them out and turned them into sculpture. But what we have is a very, very highly articulated model of the surface of this house. There you can see the chimney up at the very top there that, that this thing keeps picking up. And then you realize how far up in the air that thing is. Um, that we now have this very sophisticated surface model of it. And then we, as we see where the surfaces are pushed and pulled by the people who made it, we start to can start to see what might be behind those, the, the, those, those wall surfaces. Um, we did find, and I think you, were, you already knew this, we found the name of the architect. We did, Katie did a lot of research on who this person is. There's, it's a, you know, L.M. Jacobson is the architect on the, the couple of blue, blue line of blueprints. They're old school blueprints that are still left from the original drawings. And then there's some, some preliminary drawings that uh, I think John, you suggested that Mr. Stavig might've made his tracings over top of his drawings. Um, you know, it, it's a, it's an amazingly large house. It's an amazingly well-built house. This is a picture, John, this is that picture I think you all were referring to. It's past the point where you can see what I wanna talk about here for a second, but um, the, the sheathing on the exterior of the house is solid plank uh, lumber. And you can see how many knots are in that, that lumber. The quality of the lumber they were able to get was amazing. That all, and and long and also uh, in strength and because it's all growth that they're there. I think you can see the bundles of. I think you you can also see the bundles of lath that are down yeah. there. Yeah, that's part of the seven miles of lath that are nailed <laughs> to the wall. But it's uh you know it, it's it, if you when you when you look at it this at this point it's got the flourish of the turret on it but this is a pretty simple construction with a lot of really nice again like what may be buried in the walls. You know, there's a really well done porch put on it, and then there's a really well done sunroom put on it. But it's a fairly simple box, other than that, um, you know, kind of the kind of turret uh, element there. Um, so, you know, how do we how do we begin to try to explain what we see from the spaces that this this thing makes? And uh, you know, one thing that we already know is that. There's a, a there's a main floor, the piano, kind of a, what we call in architecture the piano nobile, the, the, the formal surface of the house, uh, with a veranda on the front and a nice uh, sun porch on the side, uh, out off the butler pantry. And then there's a, a, a well apportioned um, with I believe the same plate height as the first floor, maybe even higher, uh, second floor there. Uh, all the floors are accessible. Those two, those, you go ahead, John. Nope. Oh, I thought, I thought you had something. Uh, you know, the, the, the first two floors are linked by a stairs at the front of the house. I, 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 I'm trying to figure out how to get a cursor here and I, I, I would kill for a, oh, wait. maybe, nope. Anyways, uh, I'll just I'll just try to point out to you. So there's a stairs you can see coming out on the right hand side of the, of the drawing on the first uh, of the image on the first floor. There's a nice set of stairs that, that lead you up, uh, kind of the formal stairs, but they only go from first to second. The stairs on the far left side of the house go from exterior, rear, outside door, uh, up to the attic and down to the basement, all the way up and down. Um, there are really really tightly done. Uh, set of stairs in the back back there. But the, the attic space is, um, uh, of course, lower ceiling height. And, and John, you you you, uh, you all have speculations on how the attic was used. Uh, the new immigrants were coming in and living there, right? Right, they, 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 would, uh, they had immigrants that came from Norway to Sisseton. They didn't have a place to room. So they roomed those individuals up in that third floor. And then they found employment at the Stavig Brothers store or farms. And so they were had a place to live, could make some money. 
they could get you know their feet on the ground and then maybe go off and and, and find their own place but uh, they were uh, they were they were pretty welcoming that way in that regard and and that's why you know that's why there was a, additional rooms built above there yeah it's it's uh the, the the there's one there's one bathroom in the house um uh there's well there's there's facilities in the basement and i believe probably the people in the attic use the basement facilities um so this is by the by the way it's laid out it seems that way um there's also uh some larger scale laundry and kitchen uh, work done in the basement as well, which which brings the dumb waiter, which is another very interesting cavity uh, in the house. But one of the keys to this, though, that that also uh, I think is 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 creating some of the issues we have in the in the houses. At this time, people were still building what's called balloon framing. Balloon framing is undergoing a, a renaissance now that um, um, synthetic lumbers are are available. And people can, you know, manufactured lumber or, or, or constructed lumber. I, I forget what they call it. Anyways, um, you know, but, yeah, you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the, the, the way that most houses like the house I'm in are built is the bottom system there. That's the modern Western platform frame where basically you build a platform, build the walls that go on top of a platform, build a platform on top of those walls, then build another set of walls then build another platform on top of that and just keep, keep, Going and the reason for that, why we moved that mainly is because if you look at the top balloon frame system, the studs go from top to bottom, and then the floor is hung between them. So you have like almost like full length spaghetti, and then you you put a bar across it, and then you lay the the floors into that. Um, we can't really until uh, we we haven't been able to get wood that long that good for a long time. And the other issue with that is which is both both positive and negative is in the platform system, it's very difficult to move from level to level with any kind of mechanical system. Um, but it's also a positive in terms of the, um, the issue that the balloon frame houses really ran into troubles for a while was that the, the walls became chases in case of fire. So that the fire could go all the way up through the wall quickly, whereas the platform frame, it had to burn through another platform and then get, get up through that, which slowed it down. But, you know, Brian, that's interesting because when I look at the, the estimate from O.T. Oxness, the lumber dealer in Sisseton, they're listing, for instance, 25 two by tens that are 22 feet long. Yeah. Yeah, you couldn't, you couldn't buy that now. It just, I don't know, I don't know. they would have them, nobody has 22 foot long. Two by tens. Studs. Yeah, yeah, two, yeah, yeah. Or, oh, two by tens, yeah. No, nobody, nobody, you know, manufactured lumber allows that now, but um, so, so you, so anyways, you can see that it's, it's a very different system of, of making, of making things, but it also allows, uh, let me see if I can bring this up. Let's see what's next year. Yeah. So just, just real quick, um, you know, the house is really, really, you can, you can feel the, the craftsmanship of the people who built the house and you can feel that the people who specified the materials of the house uh, the, there's no, I, I would say that the, the house is not opulent, but the house is well apportioned. Right? I, I guess that, does that work? That yeah. the, the, the wood is a, the wood is a very high quality. Is it exotic? No, but it's a super high quality. You, if you look, you'll never see a knot in the wood. Um, you can see this is a, this is a, a window frame, which was probably made on site by the, by the carpenters. Um, there are some, we, as you pointed out, uh, John, there's some unique details in it that maybe have some other histories that, that, that are there that, that that's about as opulent as the house gets, um, <laughs> is, you know, but there's a, there's another kind of, I wouldn't call it opulence, but it's another kind of beauty. And when you see things like this built, cause you, that, that's a beautiful, beautiful, uh, set of joinery and woodworking by, by somebody who knows carpentry really, really well. We really worked hard and looked really uh, like at the the deck, the subflooring below, to see if there was, you know, the the if there's any other indications that you can see that there were anomalies in the way it was built, so that we would find some evidence, more evidence of the, of the shipbuilding uh, backgrounds. And I think this kind of stands. Explain what we're looking at. So we're looking at a transom window over a wooden door uh, in the second floor. 
so this is a bedroom uh, bedroom door, uh, which you can see this 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 a, number one it requires a very high ceiling, but this also enables a, a hot house to get a little cooler. I wouldn't call it I wouldn't call it too cool too cool, but you know it, you don't have to keep your your door open to uh, to get to get ventilation with these these transoms. Um, I'm not sure what kind of wood it is. It, it it looks like maple, but I don't know woods that old that well. Um, and old growth stuff like this, it, it could be something else. Uh, for all I know, well, you you have the you have the way bill. Does it say what kind of wood it is? Uh, no, there is there is ash also in there. You know. Yeah, that that might that it, yeah that might make that would make a lot of sense. Uh, what about this would be. the benefit of the transom? Was there air intake that came through the house then? Yes. Yeah. That you know that the with a with an open window because of. Uh, Central hallway. If you've ever lived in a dorm without air conditioning, um, you know the, the it's, it's terribly hot. So you have a choice of either sh shut your door or have no air circulation. But the transom affords that. It also moves the air. But the, the window is lower and the transom is higher, so it actually helps circulate and roll the air in the room too, because the air comes in on one side uh, high and, and then leaves low or vice versa. We um, also see that there's vent in the walls, in those bedrooms, vents that come through the walls. What's the benefit of the vent as compared yeah. to with the transom? I've got about I got about 15 slides of vents coming up. So, okay. okay. <laughs> Hang on on that one. <laughs> I'm almost there. There, 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 are, there are things about it that are odd that make me think that the architect didn't do elevation drawings, that there isn't a level, there wasn't a level of engagement with the architect um, to a depth. That there is a, a well apportioned plan built. Um, the, the Queen Anne style was executed well, but there's things like this that are uh, they're, they're interesting and odd. If you notice, there's one, two, three, four different heights of door or uh, <laughs> a frame there. Uh, the, the door into the dining room is lower than the, than the, the one before it, and then the hall, hall closet. And in, from the drawings you you all had, John, that that, that seemed like it was probably one of the Stalvigs. Uh, doing the drawing and so it seems like they got a good plan and then went over this and over this and uh, and and then the carpenters hopefully which is a good idea the carpenters had their way with it and because this is all excellent carpentry it's just kind of odd in, 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 in its amalgamation uh like that it's not a problem it's 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 um yeah it's not a problem at all but it's it it's a little unique yeah yeah it, an architect probably would have made a more more complicated door for the closet and make, carry that that lintel over, and then may cost you a lot more money. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, I'm not sticking up for the architects here with that. There we go. And and like, like you pointed out, there are there are uh, advanced systems for the time. This is a thermostat, right? Right. So there there's, there was thermostatic control uh, at various points in the house. This was, I believe, in the dining room. That is correct. Um, so we, we have things like that in it. And then there's this, which is, you know, it, it, you can't draw this and there's, I've got a couple of slides here of it, but if you look closely at that pattern, that's a very complicated pattern and it's not just a simple spiral. It's not just a simple, it, it's, um, you know, what it, what it clearly shows evidence of, um, uh, more than shift building is what we call marquetry. Which is the ability to really, 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 in a very detailed way, shape wood this way, um, you know, like like this. Which is, like you said, though, the level of trigonometry that goes into this kind of stuff is, a, you know, again, uh, somebody can draw that, but not, somebody couldn't draw all of this and not have a, a, a much broader set of drawings than what we have. Like this, if you notice, it starts on the left there as just simple laps. And then it turns into that that third piece coming into it, that, that kind of uh, odd register. And the way you can tell it's really well done is you never see a tiny piece. There's always a capacity that you you put a piece in there that's big enough. I don't know if that makes sense, but that you never see a little chunk stuffed in there like you see so often these days when, when it's treated like wallpaper. Brian, the group um, that came from Norway, the tour group, when they looked at this floor, several people said this is just exactly the way they lay up the bow of a ship in in, in a wooden ship uh, in the olden days yeah it's it, it's i don't think you could draw that 
with a with a clear conscience that it looks it 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 you know just notice for instance like if you look at the the first triangular or triangularish uh, trapezoid there on the far left and you follow those back each one of them has a greater length with the one in front of it than the one before in some kind of yeah I'm not this is I like math but this is a little past this is somebody's doing something but here here we go. Um, so you're right. That may be ash trim, and again, the, the the clear the the clear quality of that trim. I mean, somebody knew how to get really really good lumber for this house. Uh, that that's really clear. But then these things start to start. We started to notice these things. We started to take record of these things all over the house. And then, you know, one of the things I want to as we finish this up and turn this into boards that go into the house. One of the things I really want to do is to make a make a model image that shows where each of these are. Uh, and kind of drop everything else around them so you can just see these guys because there's this one here and they don't they don't register at regular positions within the room the wall or in the room and uh, they don't there's no evidence that they come down through the basement and we're not really completely sure how far they go yet uh, there's one behind a crib there's one behind a, um, a, a wardrobe, an armoire, one in the corner. Uh, this is what they look like. They look like they are of, a, of, the, of the period. We, there was one that wasn't screwed in, so we took it off and took some photos of it. It's clearly, you can tell by the way, the lath is not finished on the left-hand side uh, where, the, where the parging or the, the, the plastering uh, doesn't quite cover that board, that that's original, that's not cut out. Um, so it, 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 it was part of the house when it was built and we stuck a camera, you know, stuck a phone up, the, up that hole and it goes up, but doesn't go down. And, uh, we're not sure where it goes. <laughs> uh, we can't find any place where they seem to register together. Was this allowed um, because of the balloon construction in the wood? Right. Yeah. It, it, it would, that, that would go forever. And that's what the backside of the lath and plaster looks like, by the way, it's, uh, so they, they push that plaster through the lathing to, to lock it into place like that. So that's the back, that's the backside of, inside of two, the two sides of a wall, right? Um, yeah. And um, the, it just seems to go up and it just, I, I'm assuming through stack effect that they, they drew air or, but we, you know, we didn't move all the pink insulation in the attic to see if they came up through there, but if they did, they would be covered with pink insulation by now. Um, yeah, so I don't know if you've ever noticed an airdrop through them. But there's no mechanical system behind them. And they, you know, they kind of sometimes they're down at the baseboard, sometimes they're up on the wall. Sometimes they're 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 on one side, sometimes they're on the other side. <laughs> they, they, you know, if you notice they sometimes that that one's standing and that one's on its side. Um so the the fins behind it, the louvers behind it are are horizontal there and vertical there. Um, so that, that's one of the puzzlements, uh, that's one of the first puzzlements we still have that we're still trying to figure out. And you know, one of the things I'd like to do is you, we can just locally build a bit of the framing model around one of these spots and see if we can figure it out. Um, I, I've never seen anything like this before. And it's probably the, the, the biggest simple surprise uh, of, the whole, of the whole experience. And the, the scanner isn't really you know, when, when, we lo when we locate them in the scan, there's nothing about the wall that says it's thicker or it's got extra conditions to it or it's got a cavity in it. It just reads as just some other part of the wall. So we're, we're still figuring that out. But we've got the, the one gap in there that I really, I really, I really uh, am enjoying uh, is this, if you can see slightly to the center if you look at the bottom, you can see the fireplace there slightly to the center of the image. And behind that fireplace, if you look up, you can see all the way up to that chimney up there, uh, there's, a, there's, there's, a, there's a slot in there and it's larger than the chimney, which by the way, we, we, we realized is it's, it's a little bit turned at the top, the chimney is. Uh, it's a long way to go with brick. And John, that's where all your brick are probably at is in that chimney. Because uh, you don't have a whole whole great amount of brick in, in the house. No, but that no. that thing is. I, you know, at 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 sixteen dollars a thousand, they were pretty expensive. Yeah, that's why they didn't make brick houses up here. Uh, 
but it's probably a long way to a brick factory from Sisseton. We want to just remind people, Brian, that if they do have questions, just put them in the chat and, uh, okay. and Brian will answer them as we go along. One, one that did come in from, from a school of architecture standpoint, Brian, mm -hmm. what's the value of preserving a structure like this? Well, all things, you know, all old things become new again. You know, here we are, we're back to balloon framing and we're realizing now with new lumber technologies and new ways of fire stopping that uh, there's efficiencies in that kind of construction when it comes to modularity and all that kind of thing. So these old buildings uh, sometimes are, sometimes we find ourselves back on, on that thing, on that, on that system again. Um, I think also too that the, as cultural artifacts, they're they're amazing, beautiful things to uh, you know to to keep and to hold and to have a kind of a residue of the past, just just like any other museum piece. Um, from a school of architecture point of view, we need more we need more Stavik houses uh, that we can go look at. Um, we need more, you know, we 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 need you know, we we're we're not going to go poke around the fishback house. <laughs> Uh, which would be the the nicest house I think in Brookings. Um, a lot of the houses, a lot of the structures in Brookings, other than the the post office, are, are privately held. Um, people are people are nice about it though. But you know, there's a lot of sensibility. Like when you look at the craft in this house, the craft, the beauty of the craft comes from a simplicity in solving a problem with with a particular material. That the way the exterior of this house is built is to get the water off the surface so all the drips and all the edges and all the lips and all the fascias and all the different pieces of the house are all about shedding the water away from the house and because it, it's not a it's not an envelope it's not solid and so the shapes we see and the things we think of as just being decorative are often quite functional um, I, I, I'm not really answering the question, I guess, well, but there, there's just so much we can learn from uh, historical structures. And there's no reason why we couldn't be building like that um, if, if Lowe's would just get out of the way. <laughs> this is not question a Lowe's came in. A question came in. Back, Go ahead, yeah. It says, back then when creating plaster, I was told that horse hair was added to the plaster. Why was the horse hair added? That would have to be for re like a reinforcement, like um, in, in modern technology and concrete. Now we're putting uh, uh, iron filings into it, which is which operates like that. Where it, um, the let's see, I'm not a structures guy, but the the plaster is highly compressive in strength, but it doesn't bend. And the, the something like horsehair or metal helps um, a brittle material like like concrete. Or, or plaster to bend, to be able to uh, flex more than, than than it would if it was just without it. Is, I don't know if that makes sense or not, but it, it's it it just reinforces it. Um, I know of no other reason, and I I don't know really if you do that how you get the horsehair off the surface. I think um, uh, I, I, I think uh, when we we've had a piece of, of plaster that's come loose, we've retained that. When you hold it up to the light, the base coat of plaster. The, the first coat is the one, and you can see, you know, a reddish horse hair or a, or a black one, you know, I mean, you can just see, I suppose really? back then they had a lot of horses and, uh, and, and so they would put that in there as a material, the way I understand it, to, to buy, help bind the plaster together. Then over that first coat was a finished coat, you know, that did not contain any. But I suppose it's similar to, and I, if Larry Peterson's on the line, he could probably tell us that I think at one time they put fiberglass into concrete like for exterior to help yeah. it bind together you know but uh, other questions that come in go ahead and put them in the chat and we'll sure. try to get a hold of them here is there another one there um uh, ryan puts oh, okay. out put, puts out here that that if they want gotcha. to learn more they can click to the facebook okay. page, so yep yep um so let's move forward a little bit so this is the only image i have of the uh the really different can you all see the chat in front of that or 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 yeah, I'm sorry. I, I you can, can't get You can the, click on the X and you can drop the chat so that the chat goes away. Yeah, I don't have a cursor. Anyways, uh, th th this is the only, can you, can you, can you see the chat in front of the image or? Can yeah, you, you can. See the image? All right, dang it. 
I can't find a cursor. Here's, here. a, here's another question. Why did they make ceilings so high in those old houses? Uh, partly because you could, because you had the money to. Uh, just like today, you know, uh, high ceilings are 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 uh, kind of a yeah, they're kind of a luxury, but they also uh, help the air to rise. Um, you know, the, the the higher the room, the the more you can get the the air to rise through it. If you see, you you can't afford you can't put a transom in unless you have a high ceiling either. So those doors with transoms require at least at least a ten foot, if not an eleven or twelve foot ceiling up there. And it, it appears to me, I haven't double, I need to double check this, but it appears to me that the second floor is actually a higher plate than the first floor, uh, which is actually fairly unusual. Usually, the first floor has the higher plate or the taller ceilings. Um, go ahead. We've got a few minutes left. I'll just let people, if they if they want to ask a question, just go ahead and unmute unmute your mic. And uh, just interrupt Brian, he's used to that from teaching. So uh, go ahead and ask your question in the last few minutes that we have here. Go ahead, Brian. Oh, these, these are um, these are that slot of space in the middle. This, this is sort of the, the, the key part of this thing here. So you can see at the top of that image is the, is the chimney. Then if you follow that down, there's a hole in the top surface and that goes right down through all the way to the basement. But if you look close down at the bottom, What's interesting, so you can see it there, right? That there's a, there's a vertical wall that goes through there and then there's that hole in the middle of the top of this thing like a donut. And that's the, that's the, the chimney space, but it's not just the chimney, even so much that if you look down there at the bottom, you can see the fireplace is not in there. Hmm. The fireplace is actually, so there's gotta be a, a pretty significant structure behind that fireplace that takes it back and draws all that air back all the way to that chimney, which is quite a ways away. Um, you mentioned that they didn't really use the, the fireplace uh, much. That's because if the store burned down the next year yeah. and he wasn't real happy with that. So he wasn't going to start the fire in the fireplace when he just had to deal with the store that burned. I wonder if that, that arrangement has to do with fire safety, the way the distance from the, from the firebox to the, to the, to the flu. That could um, be. But because it's, it's completely outside of it. Um, this is another thing that you all showed me that was really fascinating is that's a, what appears to be a little pantry, but behind it is is that is that same space. So the, so the, the you can see to the to the left there is that circle where the the old wood burning uh, stove used to uh, connect to the to the flue there. So that's the flue right there, and this is in that auxiliary space there in behind the fireplace around next to it. And there's all kinds of things going up and down inside there. Uh, there there's there's things that have been put in there, and and they they some of them appear as like they've been added later like the pvc pipe um i don't think they had pvc in 1960 <laughs> but um it, it, there's a there's a there's, and then when you get upstairs in the second and third floor there's there's these kind of things which exist in that space as well um and we're not again we can we found some of this in the attic but we're not really sure um so we're not um i guess to wrap up because i, I didn't realize i I've, I've come up on time um you know, we're still working on this. It's taking a, it's taking more time, and it's it's been more difficult uh, to manage this scan than any any project we've done before. And that's okay. We're we're learning what we're learning what it does. And Spencer's uh, done an amazing job of this. But there's things about this that we're still trying to figure out whether they're original, whether they've been added later. And to, to what effect did they do? Like all those uh, small bits. So it's an amazing house with lots of mystery still to it. And uh, you know, I, I I love working on things like this. So Brian, Brenda's got a Brenda's got a question. Go ahead and sure. uh, open up your mic, Brenda, and ask uh, uh, the the question. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. <clears throat> okay. When I asked you about the high ceilings. Mm -hmm. They were in the old stores here in Wild Bay, South Dakota, in the grocery stores everywhere. Mm -hmm. Why? You had to heat with coal or wood. What What was the point of that? Like we now our ceilings are lower. Um, what would be the advantage of that to try to stay warm in South Dakota? Yeah, I think part of it was the. The, uh, oh, I can't remember the name of the window, but there's the prism, prism glass windows in all those stores they used to have over top of the awning. 
Uh, so the awning would come out over top of the, the, the vitrines, the glass displays, and, and block the sun from there. But there would be that kind of prism glass opening up, up above that, that, which have mostly all been now covered up. So I think there, was, there were issues of light and making it airy. And, you know, they didn't really thermally, people really didn't expect thermal control the way they do now, nowadays. And they oh, I know, would. but I mean, it was so cold in South Dakota and the heat yeah. always rises. Why would, why wouldn't you keep it lower? I know it might be a little cooler in the ceilings and he had a little dippy old fan just barely yeah. moving. And it, it just don't make no sense to me <laughs> why they did that. <laughs> I, I I don't think they worried about the fuel much back then either. I don't think it cost much to heat and cool stuff or heat yeah, stuff. Yeah, but when you didn't have trees till <laughs> when the Roosevelt thing come in, they built shelter belts. There wasn't any trees up on the prairies. You know, that you raise another point there too, that maybe they just did it because they did it some other places. And uh, it's just, you know, force of habit got people here to build because i there's lots of ways that people could build differently here to mitigate uh against the cold and, and against the extreme both extremes that uh you know again lowe's kind of controls it now so we build the way lowe's says with a clocking gun you know yeah, anyway. like my reached- house is like my got two-story house my mother built trees now and i can't even get my house warmed up at 80 degrees you know we, but- we th- we thank you for your questions. We're, we're, oh, we're thank you very much. It's yeah. very been a very good program. I love it. And we'd I like to thank the South Dakota Humanities Council for their uh, help on this presentation tonight. Uh, thanks for joining the Stavig House Museum uh, presentation on If These Walls Could Talk. And we want to thank uh, uh, Professor Brian Rex for his help. Thank you all. Have a good evening. Bye-bye. <laughs>